I tell you what, um, you know, the Bible says to train your children up in the way they should go. So I've been training on Kirsten. And uh, my wife is not real happy with my training. Uh, I was telling a couple ladies earlier, yesterday, Kirsten and I, uh, I'm going to find a way to get this thing. All right. The other day, uh, yesterday, we were doing something at the house, and, and Kirsten said something to me. Now, PJ and I wax poetic about different things that are in our past. And one <clears throat> from my past is the cartoons that we used to watch. So Kirsten said something to me, and I kind of went, what? And she looked up and said, it's a joke, son, a joke. You missed it. Flew right past you. <laughs> I thought PJ was going to blow a gasket. So I'm training her to te talk like Foghorn Leghorn. PJ wasn't real happy with that one. But speaking of children, uh, I'm going to skip around a little bit, but mostly I'm going to be in numbers. I'm going to be in Numbers 13. That's in front of the Bible, the Old Testament. I got it. You got that, huh? A little bit later, we're going to be in Matthew, but that's all right. We're going to stay in Numbers. Now, at one point in time, this is going to be in, this was in Matthew 7, 7, uh, 7, uh, shoot, 1913, can't even talk. But at one time, uh, there was a bunch of folks that were bringing kids to, to, to Christ and let Him bless them. And the disciples were like telling them, look, the man's busy, leave him alone. Get the kids out of here. And uh, Christ said, hey, stop. Bring the kids to me and don't hinder them. Because the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. It's very important that the children be evangelized. That's what God was saying, what Christ was saying. It is very important that we evangelize the children. I think that there's not a whole lot that's more important because as with anything, if there are no children in our church, our church is dying. Does that make sense? <coughs> if there are no children in your household, one day you're going to die and there's nobody, nobody going to give you stuff to. Which, the only thing I'm going to be able to give my kids is bills. <laughs> but hey, but seriously, <coughs> if there are no children, our church is dying. That is, that is important. That is the most important thing is to evangelize our children. <clears throat> Train them up in the way they should go. How do we evangelize our children? Well, first of all, we've got to get their parents in, in, involved. And, and it's important that, that we get their parents sitting in the church because if the parents learn about God, then they can teach their children about God. And their children, although they will not admit it, the children listen to their parents like hawks. Most of the time when they get to be teenagers, they're listening to the parents for something they can argue about. When they're younger, they're soaking up everything. So how do we evangelize the children? We need to have something Somewhere, somehow, our children can learn in a setting that's not listening to some idiot up here talking to parents and talking these big, long words and stuff. He needs to have something broke down to their language. Karen's been trying to do that. Unfortunately, fewer and fewer children are coming. Sometimes there's two and three children, not age. 
Sometimes there's two or three kids. We need something in place. And she can't do it alone, by the way. It's, it's a big job. We have been looking, and, and before you start throwing stuff at me, hear me completely all the way through. We've been looking uh, for a place to call Arrow Trail Cowboy Church that is our own. Will we ever desert love and war in Texas and have something here? No, because this is where adults are evangelized. This is where we the rubber meets the road. This is where, as Christ said, is it not the sick that need a doctor? But we need to evangelize our children. We need to have something to get their interest. Because I'm telling you from personal experience, if God is not more enticing than Satan, God loses out. As they get older, the world becomes more and more Boy, it becomes larger and more enticing. But if you remember in 713 of Matthew, he said, narrow is the gate that leads to, leads to God. Wide is the gate that leads to destruction. destruction. You're checking me out, aren't you? That's all right. But... If we don't narrow that scope, if we don't narrow that vision, we're going to lose them. And when we lose our children, then our children grow up believing the world is all this and, and, and God is nothing. And then they take over our country. What happens? We're no longer a God-fearing country. Now we're going to go to Numbers. Numbers 13. And I'm going to be uh, 13 and 26. I'll give you a little backstory. Moses raised Egyptian, an Egyptian prince. He uh, murdered a guy, left Egypt, lived in Midian a while. God called him up out of the out of Midian and said, hey, go back and get my people and bring them home. So Moses did. He followed God. Now, now remember, he went back to a place where he was probably wanted for murder. And going to a, a, a hard-fisted ruler to say, you need to let all your slaves go and let him come back with me. So, Moses goes. He convinces Pharaoh, God convinces Pharaoh by some very nasty means. But it took a lot to, to get Pharaoh to loosen his grip. They go through the desert. Now, now there were, were plagues, that, that happened in, in uh, Egypt that did not affect the Israelites. There was, going from, from Egypt to the Promised Land, they came up to the Red Sea. And here's uh, Pharaoh's army chasing them, wanting to get them back. God parted the Red Sea. They walked across on dry land. When they got to the other side, He pulled the waters back in on Pharaoh's army. Miracles. When they needed something to drink, rocks gave them water. When they needed something to eat, quail was sitting on the ground for the pick to, for them to pick up. Uh, manna came from heaven. Miracles all over the place. At the first sign of, of, of uh, when when Moses went up to get his ten commandments, what did they do? Man, Moses taking too long. God, God must not be very powerful. Let's give us a, a, a golden calf. That's what we need. Worship is golden calf. I've trailed cattle most of my life, and I would not worship them rascals. I do not understand why they wanted to worship them nasty animals. 
But that's all right. They wanted to. So they got them a, a cat. And God forgave them of all this now. Every time they mess up, God forgives them. But they make it to the promised land. And Moses picks out some spies to go into the promised land and look around and come back and report to them. And this is where we're at. They come back. Starting in 26, they came back to Moses and Aaron uh, and the whole Israelite uh, community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them and, and, and the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses uh, this account. We went into the land which you sent us and it does flow with milk and honey. Here's the fruit. But the people who live there are powerful. The cities are fortified and very large and even the descendants of Anak and, and, and the Amalekites live in the Negev and the Hittites and the Jes... I can't pronounce all these names. They live all over the place. The Canaanites live near the sea by Jerusalem. Now they're talking about all these big people and exaggerating. They're giants. Look like a country of basketball players or something. I don't know. But they're giants and, 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 and they have big cities. And, and in, in 30, Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, we should go and take possession of the land. Well, we can certainly do it. The men who had gone up with him said, we can't attack these people. They're stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a report about the land that they had explored. They said the land was uh, was the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people saw that the the great they're a great size. So they got the people thinking, oh my goodness, we can't do this. They took that little narrow view. God says, take this place, and they took that narrow view, and they broadened it. But there's big people, there's bad people, there's mean people. The, the, the land devours them. Now they're scared. Now we are in fear of our life. What they tell him? They said, oh my goodness. Well, you know, why didn't we just die in, uh, die in Egypt or, or in the desert or something? You know, why did God bring us here? God got upset. Rightfully so. Because you're supposed to keep your eye on God, right? So I'm going down into... Uh, got to love this. Alright, we're going to go down into 14 now and 30. Now God, God listened to all their complaints. Numbers 14, 30, He said... God said, not one of you will enter the land I swore with uplifted hand to make your home, except Caleb, son of Jephaniah, and Joshua, son of Nun. As for your children that you said would be taken as plunder, I will bring them to enjoy the land you have rejected. But you, your bodies will fall in this desert. Your children will be shepherds. Uh, your children will be shepherds here for 40 years, suffering your unfaithfulness until the last of your bodies lies in the desert. For 40 years, one year for each of the 40 days you explored the land. God said, all right, you don't want to follow me? Fine. Don't follow me. Stay right here. Cry because you're thirsty. Cry because you're hungry. Cry because it's too hot. You don't have a city but you're not going to get the blessings that I promised because you're not following me. Your children, your children will get the blessings, but you won't. So we, as a church, have been, have been trying to find something, trying to do something, and if you really want something done, you sick somebody on it that's going to bite it and not let go. So we stuck Steve on trying to find something. So uh, he found something that, that looks promising. And, and if you didn't know about this, it's because you haven't 
gone to the team leader meetings where we talk about church business. We don't do that at service. We do that at the team leader meetings. We found something and we're looking at it and we're thinking, man, this would be great. Is this what God wants? So here's what we pray. God, if this is what you want, open the doors. Let, you, let us just slide right on through. If it's not what you want, close the door on us. Don't let anything, don't let anything happen. Just close the door on us. That's why we pray. Why am I bringing this up today? Because God is telling us, you, knew, you need to get out of where you're comfortable. Don't go sit on a bench and, and I know it's cold. Sit there on a the bench and, and listen to some guy preach. Listen to some good music. As I always say, good music and mediocre preaching. And, and you sit here and you say, what, oh, done my duty. No, that is not our duty. David come up to me, uh, David Keller came up to me, was it Wednesday? Was it Wednesday? No, it was, uh, I can't remember what day it was, but they had gone to a funeral and, and said there was a, a, a cowboy poet that uh, they read one of his poems. I love what he said. And I, I might get in trouble for saying it up here, but I love what he said. He, something about, I'll follow God with, with both hammers cocked and the reins in my mouth. That's the way we're supposed to follow God. Remember Rooster Cogburn? Yeah, anybody over the age of like, what, 35 would know who I'm talking about. Everybody else would go, who? Rooster Cogburn. He was a marshal. At the end of the movie, they... I'm not going to repeat what he said, don't worry. Uh, they were up against him and he was alone. Put the reins in his mouth, cocked both hammers and charged them. That's the way we're supposed to be as God's people. What did Caleb say? We need to go now. We need to attack them. We need to follow God. We need to trust that God's got it. And God would have moved them out of the way. And when they did finally go into, into the promised land under Joshua, they went to Jericho, which was a fortified city. Never fired a shot. They walked around the city. Walked around the outside walls once a day for seven days. On the seventh day, they walked around it seven times. Blew their trumpets, sounded the horns, and walls fell on them. That's what God does. But how do we know what God, how do we know what is God's? Or what God wants us to do? How do we know what we're supposed to do? There's a three-letter word. And by the way, this is in Matthew 7, 7 and 8. A three-letter word. Ask. A-S-K. First letter means ask. Ask for what you want. Second one. Seek God's guidance. And a third, knock on the door. See if God lets you in. Seven, seven and eight says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. Everyone who seeks finds and to him who knocks, the door will be opened. What do we need to do? We need to have a place to evangelize our children. We need to teach our children. But we've got schools for that, right? we got schools to teach them about math and science and history, and, but spiritual learning, spiritual growth happens in the house and in our churches. Am I wrong? Spiritual growth starts with our parents. 
spiritual growth starts by sitting down and praying before breakfast or praying before a meal. Waking up in the morning when our kids come out, we're, we're, we're praying to God. We're reading the Bible. Kirsten comes through every morning. She wakes up at 6, 5 o'clock, comes through every morning. And, and I'm usually sitting there on the couch waiting for the coffee to cook and I'm on my knees praying. Well, not figur figuratively, I'm sitting on the couch praying. Before a meal, we pray. If something is important that we need to make a decision, we pray as a family. And it's, it's, it's funny how this sticks with a kid. There's a, a young man that used to go to church here, or his family went to church here. And he's, uh, he was, I don't know, five maybe? His mom said we went out to eat. And we're sitting there waiting on our food, and the people in the table next to us get their food, and they start to eat. And he said, hey, y'all didn't pray. That's what we need. We need a kid with the reins in his mouth and both hammers cocked, right? That's what we got to do. But we have to do that by evangelizing our children. Matthew 28, 19 20 said, Go and make disciples of all nations. <laughs> Was that set on a timer or something? Y'all telling me I've got to stop? That's, that's, wow. <laughs> it's like the, the ball in, in New York, you know, New Year's. All right, dude, counting down. Get off the stage. We have to evangelize our children. Here's the reason. Uh, I've been doing this for over 10 years now, 12 years now. I've been doing this. I've been preaching. And for a few years prior to that, I've been, I was uh, on the mission trail helping to start these cowboy churches. And I found that in a church of this setting, in our culture, that when we get kids interested in doing something and we get them wanting to come to church, they will drag their parents that they will drag their parents kicking and screaming to church. And when their parents were here, the, the... Harry, where was it that they were talking about the, uh, the next big movement for Christ? It was in England, right? Back a long time ago, some, big guy, some guy was standing on the shore and he said, the next big movement will be in the cowboy culture, right? It's happening. Did you know that since 2000, since the first Cowboy Church uh, of, in our group was started, that we have baptized, just in the Cowboy Churches, here was 200 and odd churches, we have baptized more adult men than all the rest of the churches combined. Is that important? Yes. A child will come to church. You make it interesting, a child will come to church. A woman will come to church. Grown men will resist. I, it, is, it is funny to watch a guy. He turns into a two-year-old. No, I'm not going to go! But you start playing music you can identify with. You use short sermons, which I'm not very good at. And... And he will he will come and listen. Make it comfortable. He'll listen. All of a sudden, he's hearing the gospel. And then he's accepting Christ. And he's following in baptism. All because the kid found something interesting to do and would not shut up until their parents brought him or her. Just to shut the kid up, they brought him. And now, 
They're working for Christ. Evangelize our children. Suffer the little children to come to me and don't hinder them because the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I know this is not my normal type of, of sermon, but I want to tell you something. Not only do we need to, to live for God, we need to teach our children what it means. Not only do we need to teach our children what it means, we need to show them what it means. When I was in the Army, the biggest thing they talked about military leadership, lead by example. Because if you won't do it, they won't do it. Or they will, they will reluctantly do it, but you're going to have to push them to it. But if you lead by example, they will follow. My children, I tried to lead by example. I was not a very good example at first, but we came into it. And you know what? My children are taking their children to church. My children are teaching their children to pray. My grandchildren are learning to read first from the Bible, children's Bible, and then the school books. Uh, Kirsten, she can quote Scripture better than I can because she's learning. She is learning at home what it means to ask, seek, and knock. Today I ask your prayers. I covet your prayers. Because our church is, at a, is standing at a crossroads. We're standing here seeking God's guidance. God, which way do I go? I pray daily for our church. Begging God to open the door for us. And I know there are the, our elders, our lay pastors, are doing the same thing. I ask everyone in our church, I don't care if you're just visiting here, help us out. Pray and ask God to show us the way. And you've got to make it clear, because I'm pretty sick. If you don't believe me, ask my parents and my wife. My, my, wife's mentioned, uh, my wife mentioned to my parents that I was pretty thick-headed. My, my, my mother said, well, we married him off to you, so we don't have to deal with it anymore. So, God has to make it pretty clear to me. Follow me in this prayer. Lord, I know I've done wrong. Please forgive me. Lord, I... I love you. I want to do, I want to do what, you, what you want. Lord, I pray that you make me yours. Make me a beacon for you. Lord, show us the way that, that you would have us go. Show us what we need to do. Lord, show me personally what I need to do. Lord, I know that Today, there's probably someone here that's not not got a, a personal relationship with you. If that's so, Lord, I pray that you have them come see me right after this church, after this service. They'll talk to me. Lord, I pray that you just use this church in your in, in a mighty way for years. Your kingdom, Lord, just to Help us evangelize the world, evangelize our community and our children. That's the same for your name. Amen.